Hey, this is Joe from Home Studio Corner. Today we're going to talk about what does compression look like? If you're looking for a video on video compression, this is not it. We're talking about compression when it comes to audio and mixing, something like this kick drum here. Okay, so that is just the raw kick drum recording. Now, if you've studied compression at all, I've got videos on the an intro to compression, so go watch those um, if you need more of a kind of a primer, primer, primer on compression and what it is and how it works. The kind of general overly simplistic overview is compression takes a signal, a sound, and when it gets too loud, it turns it down. And then kind of the corollary to that is once it turns it down, if the sound is like this, quiet parts, loud parts, turns the loud parts down, now we can turn the quiet parts and the loud parts up to get overall more loudness and a difference in tone. That's the really, really quick definition. Let's take a look and a listen at this kick drum. Now I know you're probably scratching your head if you've watched my videos for a while thinking, Joe, you always tell us not to mix with our eyeballs, but to mix with our ears. And that's true. But I think visualizations can help us understand it better. And my hope is that this video becomes an aha moment for somebody. And they finally say, ah, I get it. I get it now. So we're going to cover compression, what it does to the sound visually and audiologically, audially, visually and oratorically. On the screen and in your ears. And then we're going to actually kind of discuss why that happens. So real quickly, here is the kick drum. I would argue, this is not scientific, but you could divide this kick drum sound, or really any sound, into about three sections. I'd say there'd be section A, which we can make, let's go red. Section B, we'll make yellow. In section that can stay blue. So the differences are this would be what I would call the transient. This is the initial loud part of the track. If we kind of zoom out like this, you can see this. these three little waveforms here are significantly louder than these, almost double. This peak here is way louder than anything else in the track. Um, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It just That's just a fact here. The medium section here, what I would call like the body of the sound, um, it still has some significant volume, but it's not as loud as the transient. And then the tail, as I would call it, is kind of everything that happens between the main hits of the kick drum. So I would say these two are the kick drum tone itself, and this is kind of a byproduct or something you need to think about because it's going to be affected by what we do with compression um, in ways that may or may not be good. So let's listen to each of these components together or individually. Here is just the transient. I mean, that's the bulk of a kick drum tone, right? Let's mute that and just listen to the body. Okay, much less loud. It's a lower volume, but it has different information, right? It kind of has almost a woodiness uh, of the actual drum itself, kind of the tone, the body of the kick drum is there. We don't want the transient without this, usually. Um, this kind of adds a nice flavor to it. And then here's the tail. You hear a little more rumble from the kick drum as the sound continues to decline. And then you also hear bleed and noise and anything else that's in the room happening at the time that you are uh, recording the drum. So in this instance, we're hearing a little bit of the hi-hat and we're hearing the snare drum. All together, they sound like this. So they add up to give us a kick drum. Now, if we were to use compression on this, what would happen to the sound? Well, a very simple way of visualizing this could be something like this. Let's say the compression turns the transient down. Don't do that. Hold up. Let's say compression turns the transient down. Um, and then let's say it turns this one down a little bit, but then it turns all three of these back up using the makeup gain. What do you notice? When you look at this waveform versus the one before, what I notice is, check out like that snare drum hit. That is significantly louder than it was before. This body is significantly louder. Your body is significantly louder. And then the transient is significantly quieter, or it's about the same. Um, if we go back to the before, Right Here's where we were before. The transient came all the way up here, and the body was there. Check out that relationship. Now let's redo what we did. The transient's in about the same spot, but now the body is a lot louder. So we've essentially not really affected the transient, but we've turned up this part and this part because we turned the transient down, but then we turned everything back up. Here's the difference. Here's what it sounds like now. It's got more of a whoop whoop in the kick drum. The snare drum's a lot louder. Um, and the transient kind of sounds roughly the same. So let's go back, undo, 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 and back to the original. 
So that's kind of a visualization of what's happening with compression. But as you know, if you've spent any time with compression, there's more to it than, hey, just turn down the transient because it's going to act in on a continuum of time, right? We're going to talk about time travel now. I'm just kidding. We're not going to talk about time travel. But what happens is it doesn't necessarily just turn this section down nice and neat. It actually says, okay, if you cross the threshold and the threshold's right here, that's when I'm going to start turning you down. And how quickly I start turning you down is going to be based on the attack time. So maybe it doesn't start turning down till about here. And then if it's a really fast attack time, it's going to go wham. It's going to turn that sucker down. Let's just do this one. It's going to turn that sucker down as quickly as it can. Let me make another point here, right? And then and as long as it stays across the threshold, it's going to stay turned down until it drops above the threshold. Then it's going to go back. It's going to release. So it's attacking here. It's going to attack real quick like that. And then let's say the release was quick as well. And you get a sound that looks and sounds kind of like that. The initial transient, gets you hear a little of it, and then it gets cut down. And then you hear the end of it come back out again because of the way this kind of aggressive, fast attack sound that we have. Here's what that sounds like. Versus, if I bypass this... Okay, it's different and it's it's not quite the same as when we just turn down certain things. And then it gets even more complicated if we say, give me, give me a nice slow attack. So maybe the attack looks something like this, and it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna get around to it, but I'm not gonna attack super quickly. And as it does, as it's lazy and holds off on sending the attack, more of this initial punchy transient comes through. And if we go with a slow release, kind of the same thing. Well, we've already. We've come back under the threshold, but it's going to take a while for it to stop compressing. Those are the kind of visual cues of what's happening. Now, I'm going to take this, reset this gain envelope entirely because I don't want to be just theoretical. I want us to listen to it. So we're going to take this original kick drum and we're going to actually put compression on it and then see what that compression does to the waveform. I've got a compressor here ready to go. Let's first set up, our first scenario will be fast, fast meaning fast attack, fast release. So as it's compressing, I just want to go fairly aggressive so we can see it visually. But this is compressing quite a bit. It's got a very fast attack time and a very fast release time. And then I'm using makeup gain to get it to be roughly the same volume it was before. Let's make sure that's balanced. Okay, you can tell the sound is way different, but that is fairly balanced volume wise. Now let's export this. We'll call it fast, fast. We'll import it to the track and we'll see visually what happened here. Look at the difference between these waveforms. What do you notice? Let me turn off this uh, clip gain so you can see it a little more clearly. Um, you'll notice that the transient section got obliterated, right? It is no longer the loudest part of the track. If anything, this part of the body is the loudest thing that we hear. The transient has been completely killed. You even see this little blip here. I think that's where the release was letting go, and it caused a weird blip in the audio there because it's letting go so quickly. So it clamped down really quickly. As soon as the sound started happening, basically, and then it let go really quickly. And then because it was compressing so incredibly much, we had to turn down, we had to turn up everything in its entirety to get the volume back that we lost. And that makes this kick drum, I'm sorry, this snare drum bleed and all of this body and all the noise sound around that kick drum incredibly loud. So here's what that sounds like. This is a great way to ruin a kick drum because you've taken away all the transient by going too fast on the attack time. Let's adjust this again, only this time let's go with a slow attack and a fairly slow release. Something like, let's go like 100 milliseconds for both. That feels good. And I'm going to adjust the makeup gain again to make sure we're at the same volume. Okay, let's render that. Okay, check this out. Well, first it's it's in stereo because it's a bounce. Let me um let me bounce this real quick. Okay, now it's mono. Check it out. So the initial transient got turned up because of the makeup gain. Um, and you can see the shape of it's a little bit different. This one got the bulk of the compression 
and this one. But then you'll notice the rest of the drum sound, the body is still fairly compressed because of that slow release. Uh, and then we kind of have that same idea that the we still have a louder snare drum sound in the tail. So this is what that sounds like. So I tend to think of 100 milliseconds as pretty slow, but it's not really, when you think about it, it's a tenth of a second. So let's go really slow on this one uh, and just see what happens. Let's go with like a 400 millisecond. That's as slow as I can go on this. And we'll make the release the same, fairly slow. Let's see what happens when we do that. Actually, let's go with a really slow attack, but a very quick release um, and see what happens there. Okay, that's kind of cool. Let's bounce that. Now we're talking. Check out what happened now. The initial transient gets turned up and emphasized because we've turned up the overall compressor and the attack is saying, man, not yet. And then it starts to really start compressing maybe right in here. The... Uh, the body of the guitar, a uh, guitar, the body of the kick, I said guitar, that's silly, you continue to tell I'm a guitar player, the body of the kick drum gets turned down a little bit here, but then you can see in here as it goes into the tail has gotten turned up. And then we also have more of the snare drum as well. So what we happens here is we've got a nice transient heavy kick drum. We've left the transient alone, but we've brought up the body and the tail of the sound to give what I would say is a pretty cool sounding kick drum. Now, you may say, Joe, the first one sounds better. And yeah, in some ways it does, especially if you're thinking like Zeppelin, just a raw kick drum, kind of in a room sound, leave it alone. I'm kind of with you. I, would, I usually do this kind of compression on the drum bus, not just on the individual kick drum. But as you can hear, if you're working on like a pretty modern rock tune and you want the kick drum to really snap through, this is a way to do it. I actually used the longest, slowest attack that I could use, and that allowed that transient to get some emphasis because it wasn't being turned down, then everything else got squished and kind of glued together and pushed up underneath the transient. It's a very, very cool sound. It didn't use any EQ. If I said, did a blind test and said, what's the difference between these two? You'd probably say compression, but you'd probably also say some EQ as well because there's such a difference in tone just because of what the compressor is doing. Okay, this video went longer than I wanted it to, but hopefully this has been a good educational experience for you. I'd encourage you to go try some of this stuff in your own system and get your ears and eyes on this and start to really internalize on a deeper level what's happening when I compress sounds. And it's not just kick drum, that's the example for today, but the same principles apply to a vocal. What are the quiet parts and the transients on a vocal? For me, it's a little reverse. So if I say the word freedom, the F and the R are gonna be quieter than the E when I'm singing that, right? And the D and the M. So the vowels to me are the louder parts and then the quiet parts are gonna be the consonants. And as I mess with compression, I'm gonna let those consonants come out more and let those vowels be kind of turned down a little bit more. Does that make sense? So this, this concept, once you get it, will apply to tons of different areas of mixing. As always, don't mix only with your eyes, but this is a good, you got my permission to do this to, to, for educational purposes only, um, and I bet it's gonna help you with your mixes. As always, if you like this video, please be sure to subscribe, share it with a friend, and if you want a free five-step mixing guide or one of my other free guides, go to homestudiocorner.com slash free. Check it out for yourself. Thanks for watching. See ya.